And uh, welcome also to day two of the Back to Basics track. So how many of you uh, are here because this is a Back to Basics talk? Very nice. Um, and of those, or of all of you, how many people uh, came to a Back to Basics talk sometime yesterday? Wow, all right. Um, so, my name is Arthur O'Dwyer, and uh, we are going to be talking today about RAII and the rule of zero. And I'll uh, get the spoiler out of the way right up front. RAII stands for Resource Acquisition is Initialization. Um, and I'm gonna be saying a little bit about what that means, why it's maybe a little bit of a misnomer, um, and I'm gonna be putting in some little plugs for things like exception safety and uh, the copy and swap idiom and move semantics, which was also the subject of a Back to Basics talk yesterday. So, without further ado, I guess let's get started. So I'm gonna be talking about classes that manage resources. You know, resource is what the R in RAII stands for, and a resource for our purpose is anything that requires a special manual management. Uh, this could be uh, manual memory management, you know, malloc and free, new and delete, uh, where the important thing is that if I have a pointer that I got from new, I need to call delete on it at some point. There is cleanup that needs to be done manually with the pointer that I get from new. Uh, but this also applies to other kind of resources. There's uh, POSIX file handles. If I have a file handle that I have opened, at some point I need to close it. Uh, it applies to C, uh, all caps files, right? If I F open something, I need to F close it. It applies to mutex locks. If I lock a mutex, I need to unlock it. This is manual resource management. Um, and manual resource management can be easy to get wrong. Um, so, right, some of these resources are intrinsically unique. Uh, for example, uh, mutex locks. If I have a lock on a mutex, there is no sense in which I can say, uh, please give this other part of the program a duplicate of the resource that I hold. Please also give them a mutex lock on the same mutex. That doesn't make sense because a mutex is by definition mutually exclusive, right? I can't duplicate a mutex lock. Um, other ones, such as uh, POSIX file handles, where I can call dupe and, and actually give you a handle of the same file I have, that uh, is fine. Um, so this has nothing to do with whether the resource is uh, duplicable or not. Uh, RAII applies in both cases, and we're gonna see examples of that. Um, what really matters here is that there is some explicit action that needs to be taken by the program to free the resource. Right? It's something we would normally have to do manually to clean up that resource. Uh, so for the purposes of the example in this talk, we're gonna stick with the classic boring example of new and delete, right, heap allocation, but I don't want you to come away thinking that RAII is something that only applies to heap allocations. It also applies to any kind of resource you can think of. So here is a very naive implementation of something like a standard vector. Uh, this is extremely naive. It doesn't even do the geometric resizing that vector does. It just has a pointer to a heap allocation, and it remembers how big that heap allocation was, so it knows how many elements are in the vector at the moment. We have a constructor that sets the pointer to null and the size to zero, and then there's a pushback method. I can push back onto this vector um, by reallocating the uh, space, the heap allocated space that it has. So new int uh, size plus one. I then use the std copy algorithm to copy over all of the data uh, from the old array to the new array. I delete the old array. I update my pointer and I update my size and I put the new value in. So doing all of that correctly replaces the resource managed by putter, the, the data member. I do not have a resource leak in pushback. Right? Pushback is correctly implemented, but Naive vector still has a bug. Right. What's the problem with this code? Putter is correctly initialized with zero elements, correctly updated with pushback, correctly updated with pushback, and then I hit the close and curly brace. Right. Let's just walk through it. Right. Here, putter is initialized with zero elements. Pushback causes it to allocate one element, put one in the vector, uh, pushback two, causes it to create a new allocation, copy over the one, put the two in, and then, spoiler alert, I hit the close and curly brace, and the vector is destroyed, which means it winks out of existence here. Right? Uh, there is no special thing that the compiler does to clean up that int star, because I did not tell it what to do when you clean up a naive vector. 
The problem with this implementation of vector is that it leaks memory, um, not when it is in use. When it is in, in use, it is uh, perfectly balanced, uh, one new, one delete. But when we're done with the vector object, we drop the active pointer on the floor. We need to somehow delete the active pointer when the vector object is destroyed, introducing the destructor. When any object of class type is created, the compiler generates a call to a constructor. When object's lifetime ends, the compiler generates a call to the destructor. Right? So um, when we have any sort of creation of a new object, whether it's a named variable here, whether it's uh, heap allocated with new, whatever, we're creating a new object, so we call the constructor. And when that object disappears, if the compiler sees it like at that curly brace, that's where it disappears. That's where the destructor will be called. Right? That's where the lifetime ends. That's where if we have a destructor on the class, the destructor will get called. So we can write a destructor for naive vector, which looks just like a constructor with a tilde in front. And if you're sitting in the audience, you probably knew that, but I'll say it anyway. Um, and the destructor can do that cleanup that we wanted to get done every time one of these objects goes out of existence, every time its lifetime ends. Um, so this naive vector no longer leaks memory on destruction. New and delete are now balanced out perfectly, including when the vector goes out of existence. We call the destructor and we call delete that one more time to clean up. However, it still has bugs. Consider this code. Here I create a naive vector v. Uh, I put one into it. I've already done that part of the setup in my little diagram. And then I create a naive vector w, which is a copy of v. So this line makes a copy using the defaulted copy constructor of naive vector. The na defaulted copy constructor just copies each member one at a time. So I get a copy of the size and a copy of the pointer. When I copy a pointer, right, I copy the bits inside it, I copy that memory address. So my new pointer points the same place as my old pointer. So far, OK, they're sharing a thing, but we haven't seen a, a, uh, a crash yet. Let's keep going. We hit the closing curly brace. And here we invoke the destructor of W. W's destructor frees the heap allocation. And now, when we use the index operator on V, now we're accessing memory that's already been freed. And so we have undefined behavior. And then again, we, uh, we destroy V. That double deletes our heap allocation. That's also bad. So to fix this, we're going to introduce the copy constructor. This is why C++ has copy constructors. When we make a copy of a naive vector, uh, we are going to need to do something special to duplicate that resource that the naive vector holds so that when we call the destructor, which remember, we've already motivated why we need a destructor. We need a destructor for cleanup. But now, given that we have a destructor, we are also going to need a copy constructor. When you write a destructor, you probably need to consider your behavior on copy because you need to duplicate that resource to avoid double freeze. So this applies to memory. This also applies to any other resource you might be managing. Right? If you're writing an RAI class that takes a lock on a mutex, um, consider whether it does the right thing when you copy it. We'll get back to that. Now, there's something else about C++. This trips up a lot of people. Um, so if you're here because you're for the Back to Basics track, this slide is actually super important. I see people get this wrong. Initialization is not assignment. They both use the equals sign, right? That, that particular character, equals, is used for initialization of a new variable, w, in that first example. Let me use my mouse pointer here. All right. All right. This w is being created. It's a new named variable, and it needs an initializer. The initializer is provided with equals. Right? When you say int i equals 5, that is initialization. But when I already have a variable, uh, when I have a variable, and as a separate statement I say w equals v, that is not an initialization. That is not calling a constructor of w because w already exists. It's already been constructed. Its lifetime has already started. This must be doing something else. What it's doing is assignment. And it's going to call an assignment operator. And so our assignment has the same problem. When I initialize, default initialize my naive vector w, uh, and then I assign from v to w, the compiler will make that work by generating implicitly a defaulted assignment operator. And that will copy each member. And in my case, because I'm managing a resource, that's going to do the wrong thing. So I also 
if I need to write a destructor, I need to write a copy constructor, and if I need to write a copy constructor, I probably need to write a copy assignment operator. So to write my copy assignment operator here, I'm actually going to cheat a little, and I recommend that everyone in this room cheat a little. And I'm not gonna write all of that manual management by hand. I'm going to implement my assignment operator in terms of my copy constructor and my swap. Now, I haven't actually written a uh, swap member function, but you can probably imagine what that would be even without seeing the code. It would just swap the pointers and swap the sizes, and that's all it needs to do. And it can be no except. Um, by doing this, I avoid some issues. And in fact, we're gonna see some of those issues in the middle of this talk pretty soon. So this leads us to the rule of three. If your class directly manages some kind of resource, such as a pointer that you got from new, or mutex lock, or file handle, uh, you almost certainly need to handwrite three special member functions. You're going to need a destructor to free the resource. You're gonna need a copy constructor to copy or duplicate the resource to avoid double freeze. And you're going to need a copy assignment operator uh, also to avoid double freeze and to avoid leaks, because the copy assignment operator is gonna to need to do two things fundamentally. We didn't really see them explicitly happening because I used copy and swap, but it has two jobs. It needs to free the old value and copy the right value. Okay. Uh, and I recommend using the copy and swap idiom to implement assignment. Let's see why. So when you're writing your assignment operator, this is my copy assignment operator, um, we will talk about move semantics, but not quite yet. This is my copy assignment operator, and I could write it out longhand doing all of the manual memory management myself. Step one is to delete the pointer, um, and I notice now that I am using the wrong kind of delete. Sorry about that. There should be some square brackets there, right? Because it was allocated with array new, it should be using array delete. Um, so I delete the pointer, I allocate some new space, um, I copy, oh, this code is totally broken. This code is totally broken. So that's a good reason not to do that. It uses the wrong kind of delete, it copies after it's already deleted the pointer, this is terrible. Sorry about that, guys. Um, but I'm gonna claim that this doesn't have problems if you write it correctly uh, by walking through it. So if we're not doing a copy from, uh, for, if we're just doing a regular old copy from, v, from W to V, then uh, I delete V's old value, I create some new value, copy over some stuff. Oh no, this is right, this is right. Yeah, we're copying from RHS putter. Okay. This is only wrong in that it, it uh, uses the wrong kind of delete. Phew. All right. So we copy over the, the value and then we return this. Okay. Cool, that worked. We do not have a problem. Until someone tries to say V equals V. Assign from V to itself. What happens in that case? In that case, RHS is a reference, uh, a const reference to V itself. If RHS is a reference to V itself, and step one is we delete the stuff that V points to, and then we give it a, uh, a new allocation, which has some garbage in it, like that might not even be integers, right? Just garbage. Um, and then we do this copy from RHS putter to our own you know, V's putter, but RHS and V are the same object, so that's just a copy of the array to itself. So it still has garbage. I mean, the original data is gone at this point. We deleted it. So this would be a problem, right? Self-copy is a problem. But also, we have a problem in some cases if we have a templated or recursive data structure. Um, Let's say that RHS is not a reference to V itself, but RHS is a reference to some heap allocated object managed by a shared putter, managed by a vector, managed by V. Okay, we have some complicated data structure. Notice that our, our naive vector itself is not a recursive data structure, it's not a, a binary tree or, or a graph or anything like that, but it can be used to create um, recursive data structures. In this case, our struct A might be something like a tree, right, with a vector of shared putters to its children. So now I say uh, V is assigned the value of uh, the vector of children of its first child. 
right? I, ha I have a, a vector of nodes. I'm going to go to that first node and take its vector of children and copy that into V. Okay, these are not the same object. If I had just wrapped my assignment operator in a simple, you know, if the address of RHS is not this, then do this, otherwise do nothing, that's not gonna help in this case. RHS and V are different objects. But if the first thing I do is delete all of those shared putters, call their destructors, free what they point to, which frees what they point to, and so on, now RHS points into uh, deallocated memory. And as soon as I try to access RHS.size, boom, it blows up. This is why I like copy and swap, personally, because this takes care of that problem. Uh, what we do is, step one in the assignment operator, we make a complete local copy of RHS before we do the very first modification to this object itself. Right? So if there's any aliasing relationship, any owning relationship at all between RHS and this, or vice versa, this can't trip us up. We make a complete copy of our new state before we mess around with our old state at all. If there's any aliasing relationship, we, we fix that problem. So this is why I personally like copy and swap. Um, you might say this only matters if you have a templated or recursive data structure, and I think that's true, but uh, we write a lot of templated data structures, so. So I wanna talk about another benefit of RAII, which again is this notion of putting your cleanup code into your destructor, right, and into your copy constructor and, and writing those as a, as a package deal. And that is that the slogan, RAII, resource acquisition is initialization, the slogan's about initialization, but the meaning, when, when C++ programmers talk about RAII, right, you came here to hear a C++ programmer talk about RAII, and really notice that I'm talking about cleanup. The, the meaning is really about cleanup. It really should have been called resource freeing is deletion, right? Or resource freeing is destruction. But that acronym was taken, so we had to make up our own. Destructors help us write code that is robust against exceptions. Right? C++ has exceptions. We've got try, catch. We've got throw. Uh, when an exception is thrown, the runtime looks up the call stack. It finds the catch handler. If it doesn't find one, it calls terminate. But if it does, then it performs stack unwinding, uh, right? It, it, brings that exception all the way up the stack, unwinding the stack as it goes. Those functions don't finish what they were doing. They don't run to the end and return. Instead, the compiler destroys all of their stack variables. You know, those, those functions, stack frames, are at this point dead, over, gone, and all of the variables declared in them are dead, over, and gone. Their lifetime has ended, and when the lifetime of an object ends, we call its destructor. So that means to avoid leaks, all of your cleanup code should go in those destructors. Otherwise, if you try to do it manually with executable code in the body of the function, and the body of the function doesn't run, you see here, here we've gotten a, uh, a pointer to an array of ints, and then since we called new, we know that we should call delete at the end of that scope, so we do that, but somewhere in the middle of the scope, maybe hidden inside a function call, something throws. And when it throws, stack unwinding skips us all the way down to the catch. We don't execute that line that I've skipped over. And that means we don't free our resource. We don't clean up. This is not good RAI code, because it leaks memory. Not just not good code, this is bad code. It's buggy. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a little type of our own. It's just gonna be a little struct it's gonna hold our pointer to an int in it. We're going to have a constructor that can give it a pointer, and in the destructor, we're going to delete that pointer. And that's all we're gonna do. By putting that responsibility for cleanup into the destructor, we have actually fixed our code. We've fixed the leak. Now, when we throw that runtime error and it skips down to the catch, well, number one, notice it's not actually skipping over any code. We didn't have anything to do after that throw in, the, in this little example other than clean up, and we certainly don't want to skip the cleanup. Anything we don't want to skip, we're gonna put in a destructor. So that destructor is going to run when that variable ARR is cleaned up. And it's gonna get cleaned up during stack unwinding, it's gonna get cleaned up when we hit that closing curly brace. Any way we hit that brace, 
R goes away, we call its destructor, we delete the pointer, we clean up, that's what we wanted to do. Now this is still relatively dangerous code. I wouldn't want to say go home and write RAI pointer that looks exactly like this, right? Th this is a great type if all you need to do is, is delete bracket bracket uh, an int star. Um, but we would like it to be more generic. And we'd also like it to be a little bit safer because notice I gave it a destructor, but I did not give it a copy constructor or a copy assignment operator. I didn't follow the rule of three. And that means that RAI pointer is copyable. If someone made one of these and then copied it to another one, then both RAI pointers would think they were managing the same allocated memory. I would get a double delete, right? Just like in the naive vector example. So how are we gonna fix that? Do I want RAI pointer to be copyable? I actually don't want it to be copyable. And so I can improve it by making it non-copyable. The way I do that is I delete its copy, uh, copy constructor and its copy assignment operator. So when a function definition has, instead of curly braces for its body, if it just has equals delete, uh, then we call that a deleted special member function or a deleted function in general and the compiler will reject calls to that function at compile time. It will say, I see you were trying to call this function, but this function has been deleted, you are not allowed to call it. This, can, this prevents our users from trying to copy these things. Um, notice also this facility, this equals delete, even though I am using it in a class whose destructor is deleting a pointer, that use of delete and this use of delete have nothing in common. Right? They're completely unrelated, they're just spelled the same. Um, new keywords are expensive, so they reuse that one. They also reuse default. Speaking of default, what else can we do with a member function besides uh, delete it? Well, we can uh, explicitly default it. If instead of saying curly braced body or equals delete, if I say equals default, uh, then the compiler will create a defaulted version of that function just as if it had been implicitly generated. And it will do it even if it would not have implicitly generated that function to begin with. Um, so explicitly defaulting your special members can help your code be self-documenting. It can say, yes, I considered the fact that I might need a copy constructor, uh, or I might need an assignment operator, or I might need a destructor. Uh, and I have decided that the default ones work fine. It helps your code be self-documenting to explicitly default uh, your special members. It occurs to me I should take questions if there are any. If you have a question and you want to go to the mic, uh, that would be cool. Okay, cool. So the ability to default special members leads us to the rule of zero. If your class does not directly manage any resource, but instead uses library components such as std vector and std string, uh, then you should strive to write no special member functions at all. Default them all, right? Maybe write them out and explicitly equals default them. But let the compiler generate your defaulted destructor. Let the compiler generate your copy constructor and your copy assignment operator. Uh, maybe write your own swap. There's no way to default a swap at the moment. Um, there is the, the standard swap template that, that does the move and then move and then move. Uh, if you think you can do better by just swapping your members, then you might consider uh, writing that uh, yourself. Um, but uh, uh, I'll take a question. <laughs> I think it's on. I heard a tap. So if, you, um, if you're allowing rule of zero and the compiler is going to generate all your member, special member functions, you just said to write your swap, which implies that the compiler knows to call that swap that you wrote? Um, if you write a member swap function, then no, the compiler doesn't consider that magic. Um, except with ranges, maybe, I'm not sure. Um, if you write your own uh, friend uh, overload a, a non-member swap with two arguments, um, then standard library algorithms will call that swap. They'll use uh, argument-dependent lookup to find it. 
Um, and it is, in some sense, associated with your class in the same way that your operator equal, equal, and not equal, and so on are, are associated. Uh, we will see examples of writing a uh, non-member swap uh, in the slides, although I don't explicitly talk about swapping. Um, all right, so this is known as the rule of zero by analogy with the rule of three. The rule of three says if I need to write a destructor, I probably also need to write copy constructor and copy assignment. They come in threes. The rule of zero says let's just write zero of them. Let's strive. You know, you can't always get this, but most of the time we would like to write zero of these things. Let the compiler default them all. So prefer, prefer rule of zero when possible. Uh, I would say there are two kinds of well-designed value semantics C++ classes. The first kind and the kind you should strive to write are business logic classes, domain classes, in the domain of whatever you're doing. They don't care about resource management. That is not the job that your code is doing. Your code is solving a problem. It's not managing resources. It should delegate that job of managing resources to data members of that class. Um, and those data members should be of type such as std string, std unique putter, std shared putter, std vector. Maybe not even unique putter and shared putter, but if you're going to be managing heap allocated resources, then yes, you would use unique putter and shared putter. Right? Uh, use these data structures that are RAII, that follow RAII by default. Right? It's only if you need to write a custom resource management class, a small single purpose resource management class, that manually manages a resource, right? a, a file handle class, a unique putter class that manages a memory allocation, a unique lock class that manages a mutex lock. Right? These are the kinds of things that would need to follow the rule of three because they need to do something, some cleanup in their destructor. And in those cases, the resource management classes, they would acquire the resource in the constructor, free the resource in the destructor, uh, copy and swap in their assignment operator, and they would also have a uh, copy constructor, a move constructor, things like that. Or they would explicitly delete them if they want to be non-copyable. Speaking of move construction, introducing R value references. Uh, now, I know there was a couple of hours on this yesterday, so hopefully this is review for those of you who are following the track. Uh, but for the rest of you, we're showing up here. Uh, C++ 11 introduced R value reference types. The references we've seen so far with the single ampersand are L value references. L value and R value come from the syntax of assignment expressions. An L value can appear on the left-hand side of an assignment. Examples of L values are X, star P, A sub 2. These are all L values, generally speaking. Um, certainly, if those are ints, then yes. Uh, R values are things that appear on the right-hand side. So they're things like uh, 42, address of X, X plus 1. Those cannot appear on the left-hand side. All right, the, those assignments on the right-hand side, those will not compile because you can't assign to an R value, and R value must appear on the right-hand side. Uh, int ref, we call that an L value reference to an int. Int ref ref with two ampersands, we call that an R value reference to an int. Uh, as a general rule, L value reference parameters do not bind to R values and vice versa. Uh, there's one special case for backward compatibility. If I pass an R value such as 42 to a function that takes a const int ref, that will bind even though 42 is an R value. Right, if it's const qualified, then I can bind an L value reference to it, generally speaking. Um, so here, for example, I have a function f that takes uh, an L value reference. I can call f of i. I cannot call f of 42. 42 is an R value. It doesn't bind to an L value reference. I have g. g only accepts R values. I cannot pass a named variable such as i to g because i is an L value. Uh, G actually rejects L values. It only accepts R values, such as 42. Uh, H, for backward compatibility, uh, accepts both L values and R values. So we can combine this with overload resolution. I can write a function foo that takes a uh, const string ref that would bind to L values. I can also provide a second overload of foo that takes an R value reference that would bind uh, preferentially to R values. If I pass an L value to foo, if I say foo of s, uh, that considers both overloads of foo and it says I can't call this second foo because that only takes R values and s is an L value. So I can't call that one, I'll call the first one. Foo of s calls foo number one. Foo of s plus world, well s plus world is an R value. I cannot assign a new value to this expression. Uh, therefore, it will consider both, it would be able to call both, 
but it will, overload resolution will prefer the second one. When I pass an R value to foo, it will call foo number two. So all these other examples call foo number two. Uh, so that means foo number two only receives R values, which are things such as temporary expressions uh, or std moved variables that no one cares about, and that allows us to steal the guts out of those arguments. Right? If I get in an R value, no one's gonna care if I steal its guts as long as it's still destructible. No one else is looking at that object. It doesn't have a name. So the most common application of these R value references is the move constructor. The move constructor is just an overload of the copy constructor. It's in the same overload set as the copy constructor. But it knows that the thing it gets won't be missed. It knows the thing it gets is an R value. So uh, we can avoid doing these slow operations. You know, memory allocation is slow, std copy is slow. Uh, when we're copying a lot of stuff, you know, it's linear time. Um, the move constructor doesn't need to do either of these slow things because it knows that RHS won't be missed. In that case, it can just steal its guts. It can steal its heap allocation and replace its heap allocation with null. Steal its size, replace its size with null. This is much faster. This is a performance optimization. Each STL container type has a move constructor in addition to its copy constructor. STL types are all, since C++11, are all move enabled. You get this for free. And again, this happens during overload resolution. If you try to construct a naive vector with an L value, you'll get a copy. If you try to construct a naive ve vector with an R value naive vector, it will get moved and it'll be more efficient. So the existence of move semantics in C++11 leads us to the rule of five. If your class directly manages some kind of resource, such as a pointer you got from new, you may need to handwrite not just three, but five special member functions for correctness and performance. If you don't care about performance, then uh, get out. Um, no, right? This is not necessary for correctness. You can follow the rule of three, your code will be correct, as long as you do not provide a uh, move constructor, move assignment operator that might be implicitly defaulted. Um, but for performance, we would like to add these R value overloads of our constructor and our assignment operator. This will improve the performance of our code. So to summarize the rule of five, we need still a destructor to clean up the resource. We need a copy constructor to duplicate the resource uh, to avoid double freeze. Uh, we need a move constructor, or we might want a move constructor, for performance, not just to copy the resource, but to transfer ownership to pilfer the innards and transfer the ownership of the resource from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. The right-hand side then would no longer own the resource, and I would want to make sure it knew that somehow by, for example, nulling out the pointer. Uh, the copy assignment operator is still needed. That's uh, freeing the left-hand resource and copying the right-hand one. And the move assignment operator frees the left-hand resource and transfers ownership of the right-hand one. Again, the assignment operator has these two jobs, and it's easy to get them wrong, as we saw earlier, so I recommend the copy and swap idiom. Now, copy and swap leads to duplication. By the way, you might say, how do I write a move assignment operator using copy and swap? I thought the whole point of move was that we didn't copy. Well, remember, move is in the same overload set as copy. So, in this down here, I've got uh, naive vector copy is a new local variable initialized with std move of RHS. So I named it copy because it's still a copy of the original RHS, but the way it is made is by calling the move constructor of naive vector. Naive vector might even be a move only type. It might, you might not be able to copy it, uh, but I can still use the copy and swap idiom, just using the move constructor to create that initial copy and then I swap the copy with myself. Right? Create my new value, swap my new value with my old value, and then at that closing curly brace where I destroy my uh, variables in my frame, I will destroy copy, which holds my old value because I've swapped it out. So copy and swap works for both cases. Uh, the question. You have to make the move explicit because the R value has a name in this case? That's right, this, this std move here needs to be there, otherwise uh, I would be saying, uh, if the body of this looked the same as this, it's just a copy of RHS. Uh, RHS has a name, so it is an L value. I can assign a new value to RHS. I can look at RHS later and see what value it had. Um, and so the compiler thinks, well, I might do that, right? It's all local reasoning as far as the compiler is concerned. If it, if it sees that RHS might be used later, 
than uh, its null value. Um, shouldn't you still do, uh, for self assignment, shouldn't you just check for that and return early rather than doing the copy and swap? I mean, I like the copy and swap for other reasons, but. Uh, for self assignment, could I just check for that? Uh, I believe I covered that earlier with my uh, example number three, where we had a problem where uh, RHS was not a simple alias of this, uh, but was rather an alias to some, some sub object controlled by this. If I kill my old value first, I kill everything my old value owns, which might include RHS, even though they don't have literally the same machine address. Okay, thank you. All right. So we had some duplication there. We had two bits of code that looked exactly the same. Uh, and C++ gives us a tool for eliminating code that looks exactly the same. It's templates, but that would be crazy. We're not gonna do templates. Um, we're just going to take our initial copy of the naive vector by value, right? When I, in C++, when I take by value rather than by reference, that makes a copy. Or maybe it makes a move, right? That's up to the caller. All I'm asking is for my caller to give me a naive vector by whatever means they deem appropriate. If they want to move into that argument, then they will do so if they need to copy into it they can do so. All my assignment operator cares about is that I get a naive vector somehow. Okay. So we leave the copy up to our caller. Copy here is still a local variable of this scope. When, when I hit the curly brace and leave this scope, copy will get destroyed. So it still has the same semantics as the copy and swap idiom. So I'm not aware of any problems with the by value assignment operator idiom. Uh, however, it is still relatively uncommon uh, to see this in code. Uh, particularly because the STL itself doesn't do this, right? If you're writing code that is STL-like uh, and you're copying what the STL does, you will write two assignment operators. You will write a, a copy uh, and a move separately, even though they probably end up doing mostly the same thing. Um, but if you don't care about exactly following what the STL does um, and you just wanna get the code done, uh, I would consider writing just a by-value assignment operator. I, I don't see anything wrong with it. Right. So this leads us to what's been called um, the rule of four and a half. Um, so if your class directly manages some kind of resource, you may need to handwrite four special member functions, not five. Uh, the destructor, the copy constructor, the move constructor, and rather than two assignment operators, it would be fine to just write one by value assignment operator to free the left-hand resource and then transfer ownership from the right hand by value argument. You got it by value, it's a local variable of you. You know nobody else cares about it at this point. You want to transfer ownership of that resource from RHS to yourself. Uh, and then the half is the copy and swap idiom does depend on having a swap. Uh, you do need to write a swap if you're going to use the copy and swap idiom to implement move assignment. Right? Because if you don't, then when you try to swap two things, you're gonna get either a compiler error or it's gonna call std swap. And what does std swap do? It calls your move constructor and then it calls your move assignment operator and then it calls your move assignment operator again. And if your move assignment operator is implemented in terms of swap and it calls std swap and std swap calls your move assignment operator, you're gonna have a bad time. So that's why if you're gonna use the copy and swap uh, idiom, I strongly, strongly recommend you write a swap function. Um, would there be any gotchas by leaving out the R value ref overload uh, operator? Would there be any gotchas with um, the compiler looking for that in cases of like return value optimization? Would you be missing out on that potentially? Um, so the assignment operator doesn't have anything to do with return value optimization. That would, that would look for constructors, not assignment operators, because it would be creating the return slot value. Uh, I have a whole talk I gave last year, much too fast, on RVO, uh, which I recommend. Um, but uh, you could leave the uh, move assignment operator out entirely, and then overload resolution would pretty much always have to prefer the copy assignment operator because it was the only assignment operator you wrote. Um, and that would be fine, possibly a little less efficient. And if you were writing something like unique putter or unique lock that you didn't want to be copyable, then obviously you should delete the copy assignment operator and write a move assignment operator. 
but there's, there's no problem if you omit this uh, overload resolution should do the right thing and just get extra copies. Yeah? Does the logic for only writing one um, assignment operator, does that, could that apply to the constructor too? Uh, could I make a by value constructor? Um, no. The compiler will not let you do that, uh, in fact. Uh, it's not even like nonsensical. It like literally there will be an error message if you try to make a constructor that takes by value because how would you construct the parameter, your by value parameter? How would you construct it? Using the by value constructor, which takes by value and needs to construct its parameter, right? All right, constructors, it doesn't make sense to have a constructor that takes an object uh, of the same type by value because how would you construct it? I hope that did answer that question, right? Yeah. All right, so that was the rule of four and a half, where the half is the swap. So here's our no longer naive vector following the rule of four and a half. This has uh, no bugs that I am aware of. Um, not even calling the wrong delete. Correct, all right. Um, so here I have my vector, uh, which would have a copy constructor. In the copy constructor, I am copying the resource, in fact, put that up in the copy constructor, I'm copying the resource. The reason I need to copy the resource is to avoid double freeze. In my destructor, top of the right column, I'm freeing the resource. That avoids memory leaks, or resource leaks in general. In my move constructor, I am transferring ownership of the resource from the right-hand side into this object, the left-hand side. Um, and I'm making sure that the right-hand side knows that it no longer manages the resource. I'm making sure that it's nulled out. It thinks its size is zero. It thinks it's in a good state. It's empty at this point. Um, I also have this uh, swap function at the bottom here. At the bottom uh, left, I have my non-member swap. This is my argument-dependent lookup ADL overload of swap using something called the hidden friend idiom. I'm putting that friend function right in the body of my uh, class, just marking it friend so the compiler knows it's not a member. Um, it is a non-member, takes two arguments. Um, and all it needs to do is just call my member swap, which I also write. On the lower right-hand corner, I've got my single argument member swap function that swaps RHS with star this. And it can do that member-wise, just swap the pointers, swap the sizes. And it can be no except. Neither of those operations can possibly throw an exception. Um, notice that my move constructor is also no except. And I did not mark my assignment operator as no except, but I certainly could have. I think the only reason I didn't is it didn't fit on the slide. Um, but if I'm using the uh, copy and swap idiom and I'm taking by value, then the only operation I do in this function is a swap, which is already no accept, and I destroy my parameter, and destructors are no accept, so this can't possibly throw either. Question. Yes. So why did you make the two-parameter swap a friend member instead of including it directly in the class? Uh, why did I make the two-argument swap a friend instead of including it, you mean at, instead of making it a member? Yes. Um, well, if it were, if it were a non-static member function, then you'd have to call the two argument, you'd have to have an instance of naive vector and then call dot swap and then pass the two things you wanted to swap. And that's just not how the STL does things. And if it were a static member, you'd have to say vec colon colon swap of those two things. And again, that's not what the STL is looking for. The STL is looking for a function named just swap in the same namespace as vector. And that's what this idiom does. Um, all right, so notice I've highlighted uh, the places where we actually mess with the resource, right? These are the places where I'm hiding my manual resource management uh, in the copy constructor. I need to write code that explains to the computer how to copy this resource, right? The human programmer knows how to copy it. This is where I put it in the copy constructor. That's where I put the code that copies the resource. In the move constructor, I need to explain how to transfer ownership of the resource. That's usually very mechanical. Uh, you know, in this case, I'm just exchanging over the pointer, exchanging over the size. But it's still part of my programmer domain knowledge that uh, null putter zero is the appropriate representation of a 
moved from vector, an empty vector, right? That gets it back in a good state. That's part of the information the computer doesn't already know. I need to communicate it. Um, but my assignment operator and my non-member swap, uh, those are completely mechanical. They always look exactly the same. There's no uh, special domain knowledge being encoded by the human there. Um, but how to free the resource in the destructor at the top of the right column. Uh, freeing the resource, that's again something that I have to communicate. This is how you free this resource. You call delete, you call close, right? You, you call mutex unlock, whatever it is. So the highlighted things are the bits that, of information I am putting into the program. The other stuff is the boilerplate that can always be the same. We can get closer to rule of zero, right? That was sort of a rule of five vector. I hand wrote all of those functions. But if I had managed the uh, memory allocation using std unique putter, which is a resource management class that itself follows the rule of five, um, then I wouldn't have to do quite so much. The transfer of ownership is now defaultable, right? When I move construct a vector, what does that mean? It means I move construct the unique putter, I move construct the size, and I'm done. Ownership has been transferred by unique putters move constructor. I've delegated that resource management responsibility down to unique putter. Um, however, I still need to do something special to copy the resource, right, because unique putter is not copyable by design. Um, I still need to do something special to swap ownership. I mean, that, I can't get rid of that. There's no way to equals default my swap. Um, but that's a lot closer to rule of zero. That's a lot closer to what we should strive to write, even if we're writing something like vector, which admittedly is kind of a resource management class itself. But it's still able to delegate some of its responsibilities down to a simpler resource management class that's been written and tested by someone else and, and can take some of that thinking away from us. Uh, and a completely rule of zero vector, of course, would just use std vector, right? If it uses std vector, not only will it be more efficient because it will do geometric resizing and, and be written by, you know, people who write C++ standard libraries, um, but also it means now we can default all of my special members, right? Here's my rule of five. Um, I've got my copy constructor, my move constructor, my copy assignment operator, my move assignment operator, and my destructor, and I am explicitly defaulting all of them. Uh, now, if I have multiple members and I am defaulting my assignment operators, the default assignment operator will do member-wise assignment, and so that might hit that pitfall from slides 34, 36. Um, so you, you might want to explicitly use copy and swap in that case anyway. Um, it wouldn't be wrong. And again, I'm writing a swap function. Yeah. So the problem I always try and get to rule of zero, but then I find when I don't have it a constructor, like how do I get my thing, my members, initialized, is it via putters, then you got to set set or setters, set, you construct it with a default constructor and then you got to turn around and go set, 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 which feels, uh. Uh, So if I'm striving for a rule of zero and I'm defaulting all of my special members and I've got my defaulted uh, default constructor as well, um, does that mean I can't write any other constructors because I would have to write bodies for them and that violates the rule of zero? No, that does not violate the rule of zero. The rule of zero is about these five. And maybe the default constructor, maybe. Um, but you can totally have other constructors. Right? I mean, that, that is not in any way a philosophical violation of, of the principle. Right? I can have uh, a constructor that takes an initializer list of int. I can have a constructor that takes a single int and re resizes to that size. I can have a constructor that takes an allocator. Or whatever, right? Those are not special member functions, except in that they're constructors. But you always need some way to construct your object. Right? Rule of zero is about these uh, resource management uh, functions, the destructor, the copy constructor, about resource management. Um, not about how do I create, how do I construct things. It's not saying you just have a default constructor and that's it. You can definitely have other constructors. Uh, so to finish up here, we have about uh, 10 minutes left and I just wanted to give some examples of resource management. Um, so here's one example. I'm gonna go through them all in this format. Unique putter. Unique putter is an RAI class. It follows the principles of RAII and it manages a raw pointer to a uniquely owned heap allocation. So what does that mean, a uniquely owned heap allocation? Well, to free a resource, to free a heap allocation, we call delete on the pointer that's managed by the unique putter. 
uh, copy constructor copies the resource. What does it mean to copy a unique heap allocation? Um, well, it might mean to make another heap allocation, but in this case, that's silly. What we're managing here is not the allocation, it's ownership of the allocation, right? So you can't copy ownership. Ownership is by definition unique. So copying doesn't make sense. We equals delete uh, the copy constructor on unique putter. Uh, move constructor transfers ownership, right? Making sure to null out the right-hand side so that it, it knows it's no longer responsible for ownership. Uh, copy assignment, again, copying doesn't make sense, so we equals delete it. And move assignment, uh, frees the left-hand resource, transfers ownership of the right-hand one. And so it has two responsibilities. It needs to not just transfer the right-hand pointer and null it out, but also make sure that it's calling delete on the left-hand pointer, the original value, right? Assignment has two responsibilities, which again, we're mostly mechanically doing by doing copy and swap. We didn't really have to think about them. But if you are thinking about them, remember assignment has two responsibilities, free the old resource and transfer or copy the right-hand resource. Uh, shared putter manages a reference count, yeah. one increment of the reference count. So uh, the destructor frees the resource. What does it mean to free a reference count? It means to decrement the ref count, and if the ref count went to zero, you need to clean up the object. Uh, copy constructor copies the resource. What does it mean to copy an incremented ref count? It means to increment the ref count a second time. So that's what the copy constructor of shared putter needs to do. Uh, move constructor uh, just needs to uh, leave the ref count the same, just transfer the, the ownership of that reference count in some way. So null out the right-hand side. Uh, copy assignment operator has two jobs, free the left-hand resource, copy the right-hand one. So decrement the old ref count, whatever we used to point to, decrement its ref count, maybe clean it up, uh, and then increment the ref count of the right-hand side and take, take some ownership of that. Uh, move assignment operator needs to, again, do both things. Uh, unique lock, similar to unique pointer, unique lock manages a lock on a mutex. Our AI is not just about heap allocations. It's for any kind of resource that has manual cleanup. In this case, the kind of cleanup that the destructor of unique lock does is unlock the mutex if, it's, if, uh, if the lock is taken, right? A unique lock can also be in an empty state, a disengaged state. The move constructor transfers ownership of a unique lock. Uh, so that means leave the mutex in whatever state it's in, right? don't lock or unlock it at all, just transfer ownership of the lock, and indicate to the right-hand side to the right-hand unique lock, that it is no longer responsible for unlocking that mutex. That puts it into a disengaged state, an empty state. That means that the destructor, when I destroy the right-hand side, is not going to unlock the mutex prematurely. An IF stream manages a file handle and an associated buffer. Uh, so it has a destructor that calls close on the handle, on the file handle. Um, it has a copy constructor that copies the resource. Well, actually, it doesn't. The standard IF stream does not allow you to copy an IF stream. Uh, we could imagine uh, maybe doing something to duplicate the file handle um, and giving the copy a fresh buffer. Right? We wouldn't want to copy the buffer. If there was buffered output, you would print it out hello world and it had been buffered and it hadn't yet gone to a disk or screen or wherever it was going, and then you copied the IF stream. You wouldn't want to also copy the buffer because then you'd have two hello worlds eventually making it out the screen. Um, that's part of your human domain knowledge that you know about what it means to copy an IF stream or to copy you know, your custom stream class with a buffer. Um, so that's part of what you would need to communicate to the computer by putting it into the uh, copy constructor. Move constructor of IF stream transfers ownership of the, uh, the stream and, and the buffer. Uh, copy assignment operator on IF stream is deleted. Uh, move assignment operator uh, would close the left-hand stream, flush the, flush the buffer, close the stream, transfer ownership. Okay. So all of these transfer ownerships, especially for unique lock, I made a big deal about the empty state, the disengaged state. So uh, in each of the preceding examples, also unique putter, also shared putter, there was a move operation that involved disengaging the right-hand side or nulling out the right-hand side. Um, so that the right-hand side knew that it was no longer responsible for cleanup. Uh, so if you have a move operation and you're going to pilfer the innards of this class such that it no longer has its responsibility that it used to have, it also needs to have an empty state, a, a uh, responsibility-free state, a carefree state where it doesn't need to do anything. 
Um, but you can do RAI without this empty state. Right? You can do RAI with just copying, without this pilfering op optimization. The optimization helps performance, but you can do RAI with just the rule of three. That's how we did it for decades. Um, and you can even do RAI with only destroy, with equals deleted uh, copy operations and move operations, where all you can do with the object is create it and destroy it. We saw a uh, poor example of that earlier with our RAI putter that we used in the uh, exception safety example. Um, right? Delete your copy and move uh, operations. And there is at least one standard class that behaves that way. It's called lock guard. Uh, and it takes a lock on a mutex. And then its destructor unlocks the mutex. It doesn't have copy or move op operations. It just lives on the stack. And that's all it does. You make one, you destroy it. That's it. That's still RAI. And with that, we have a couple minutes left for questions. Thank you. Hi. Uh, basic question on the, your final naive vector implementation. Okay. So your copy constructor, sorry, your, yeah, copy constructor. So technically speaking, can it throw because of the new? Uh, my copy constructor can totally throw, yes. So this is why you cannot have no accept on your assignment operator because you actually, there is a copy that is done. This is, this In is my fine. assignment operator, I could put no accept because I'm not the one doing the copy. My caller is the one doing the copy, and it might not be a copy. It might be a move. Okay. All they have to do is get me a vector somehow, and that's not my responsibility. Okay. My responsibilities are just swapping and destroying, which are both no accept. So I could put no accept in this case. If I had written a, uh, a custom uh, copy assignment operator that took a const ref to a vec, and the first thing it did was call the copy constructor, then yeah, that could totally throw. Thanks. Hello? So if I have an object, and am I strictly following the rule of three? Uh, and I default the two move operations. If I assign my object to an R value, will it mess up because it's called the defaulted one, or it's going to call the rule of three that I actually implemented? And as a follow-up, will it behave differently if I do not default the move operations? All right. Uh, if you have an object that follows the rule of three, so you have a, you, you hand wrote a destructor that actually does something, and a copy constructor that actually does something, and then additionally you equals defaulted your move operations, uh, that is almost certainly a bug. Uh, the equals defaulted move operations, this is again local reasoning. When the compiler sees the defaulted move operation, it will say, okay, I'll use member wise move for that. That's almost certainly wrong for your use case. Uh, because it probably isn't going to null out the right-hand side. You'll probably end up with some double freeze in that case. Um, if you don't write uh, any move operations, you don't equals delete or equals default them, then they will not exist by default. Uh, the rules for, uh, like, if you default this one, then this one gets implicitly also defaulted, and if you delete this one, this one gets implicitly not there at all, which is somehow different from deleted, are fairly complex. There is a table going around that Howard Hinnant made several years ago uh, showing like, there's like six columns and seven rows or something like that and says like, if you default these ones, then these become deleted, um, things like that. So the rules are complicated, but essentially the, the short answer to your first question was yes, that's totally a bug, don't do that. Just follow that up with uh, another question. Would it be safe to say, in light of what you just said, that when you're following the rule of three, there would be A, be no harm, and B, maybe some clarity benefit to always deleting the two move special member functions? Unfortunately, no. Uh, that would not be right. Um, because if I'm following the rule of three, so I have my copy constructor, let's say, and then I made a move constructor that was explicitly deleted, what that means is that you can construct instances of naive vector out of L value naive vectors, but if you tried to construct a naive vector out of an R value naive vector, you'd get a compiler error. It would say that overload of the constructor has been deleted, you're not allowed to move it. And that's not what you want. What you want is for move to quietly de degrade down to copy. And the way you do that is you just don't write anything for your move constructor, okay. uh, which makes it not exist which, as I said, is subtly different from being deleted. Ah, thank you. That's very clarifying. Yeah. What this does mean is that if you have C++ 9803 code that follows the rule of three and you upgrade your compiler 
and you, you know, pass C++11, uh, it will just keep working, right? It won't quietly break. It will just keep working. Yeah. One little question. Why do you think that the STL doesn't make use of the idiom that you propose here about passing by value and delegating the responsibility to the caller? Um, why doesn't the STL use by value assignment operator? Um, partly just because that idiom wasn't invented in the 90s. You know, I, I, I want to say Scott Myers had something to do with it, but I'm not sure. Um, and once the, you know, all of the STL classes, vector and, and unordered map and all this, got two assignment operators, um, then for consistency, everything else is copying that. I think it would be weird to have some newer classes used by value and some older classes not. Um, and uh, they may have efficiency concerns. I mean, it, it is possible to write a, uh, for example, a move assignment operator that might be able to do things a little bit faster if less safely, because it has this issue with, uh, you know, if I have a rec recursive or templated data structure, um, then I run the risk of these sort of dangling pointer or aliasing bugs. Um, but the STL is aimed at speed, right? Could you move forward one slide and go back over your use of make unique there? Uh, could I go over my use of make unique? Um, possibly. So make unique, uh, has, well, it does have two overloads, so this might be an unusual overload here. If I make unique of, reg of just an int, that, give, that heap allocates one int. If I make unique of int uh, bracket bracket, that allocates an array of ints. How many ints? RHS.size number of ints. And they all become default uh, initialized. Or actually, they're probably value initialized. I think they all go to zero. But it's allocating an array. But you're not using U pointer anymore. So that? Uh, make unique of int bracket bracket uses uh, new bracket bracket internally. On the left hand side, you have U pointer. Uh huh. Which is a unique pointer to an array of ints. Oh, I missed that. Yeah. Thanks. Right. And I believe with that, we are totally into the break. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.